So the topic for today is the fifth step, fifth factor of the Eightfold Path, Right Livelihood. And um, that's usually how it's translated into English. But livelihood, I think for many English-speaking people, is uh, suggests a career. And um, it's, it's kind of broader in meaning. The word f- that's translated as livelihood is ajiva, A-J-I-V-A. And it's, um, it comes from, uh, it literally means, um, or related to, it comes out of the word uh, sustenance or what provides support or sustenance for us. And um, so what sustains our life? And, um, and so what sustains our life often for people who work is their work. That uh, we put, some people put more time into work than anything else. And what provides them with the support, the sustenance for food and housing and clothes and you know, the things we need for survival. And so uh, we live, but some people, you know, don't have a career per se. Some people are retired, some people are children. And uh, what sustains their life? What's what's the sustenance that, and and what sustains and sustenance is the kind of primary activity or primary source from which our life kind of depends and which we live by. So for a monastic, a monastic doesn't have a job per se, but the monastic's sustenance and support for their lifestyle is um, uh, is the, are the donations that people provide. Uh, and, and monastic doesn't um, eat unless someone offers them food. And so their sustenance is, comes from the support for others that arises because of how they live their lives. They live their lives dedicated to the Dharma, to practice. And, to teaching, and in a sense, their career, in a sense, is being a monastic, but their sustenance comes from the support that, that people have for that life and for what they're offering the world that way. So, uh, someone who's retired has uh, there's some primary source from which they get their uh, sustenance, their support, and um, and maybe it's Social Security, maybe it's the government, or maybe it's uh, pension or something, or their savings, and so uh, they are receiving that, and uh, and then with that sustenance, we then use it. Um, if we're a farmer, we grow our own food, and the farmer's sustenance comes from their being a farmer. If a person is a um, you know a merchant, sustenance comes from uh, their work, and then they get uh, income. And then they spend that income, and um, and they, they provide support for other people. But in that kind of receiving and then giving back uh, in a monetary economy, uh, we're we're intimately integ- integrated in effect, affected and affecting the world around us. How we consume, what we consume, what supports and sustains our life. Um, uh, comes from some source, and that source may or may not be healthy for the planet, for others, and for other people, and and um, and so we want to be supported and have a sustenance that we feel good about. How uh, what we buy to support ourselves, to sustain ourselves, and where our money goes out, and what we put out into the world. Um, that also has an impact and ripples out into the world. And um, also, and our money then supports either something that's unhealthy or something that's healthy in the world. And so to live by right livelihood, samma-ajiva, is to be aware of what sustains us and the things that we receive. Where do they come from? And are we are we acquiring these things and using these things and and sending out what we send out back into the world in a dharmic way. And um, and you find in the teachings of the Buddha this idea that we want to live dharmically. We want to live in a... Uh, and the word dharma has a lot of meanings. 
And there's in this meaning that I'm using it today, many translators will translate it as righteously. And maybe that's a, a leftover from a time when um, uh, early translators were kind of very much influenced and, and trying to offer an alternative to Christianity when they translated Buddhism into English. And maybe that's a more of a Christian term, righteously, maybe, uh, or somehow in relationship to what was going on in England in the late 1800s, that being righteous was maybe a good thing. I think in the kind of a English vocabulary I speak, uh, I don't really use the word righteous very much, and it doesn't quite feel so righteous to use the word. It feels a little bit uh, like self-righteous. Uh, is a little bit problem. Um, but the word that I like to translate dhamma, dharma, in this context is uh, justly, with justice. Are we, are, are we acquiring our uh, sustenance dharmically? Are we acquiring it justly? Is, it, uh, is, there, is justice being played out? Um, and are we, um, so whatever we consume and buy and acquire and whatever supports us to live, um, is it, uh, does it, uh, is, is there justice for people and for the planet? Is it justly acquired? The primary way of understanding this, and this becomes, I think, the heart of right, right livelihood or right kind of living, uh, is uh, the idea that, um, I repeated repeatedly for this uh, Eightfold Path series. Uh, the primary one, is it uh, causing harm? Or is it, doing the, is it causing benefit, bringing benefit to the world? And this movement and care to avoid causing harm, but instead to live for the benefit of self and others, lays really at the heart of Buddhism. And not moralistically, as I keep saying, but rather... Um, it's health, healthy to do so. And the idea of promoting health for ourselves, health for others, health for our planet, uh, has a very different feel than doing something because it's ethical or moral to do it, or we're you know, obligated to do it. But this act of generosity towards all things, uh, wanting everything to become healthy and to thrive and do well. And also it comes from this motivation towards freedom that uh, we want to, if, if what we want to do is to walk the path of freedom, of spiritual liberation, we want to live our life in a way that supports that. And to live our life dharmically, to live with a sense of justice, uh, again, not because it's kind of a heavy thing to do, but because it really feels like a movement uh, to our own freedom and the freedom of others. If we are ignorant of what the impact we're having on the world, in Buddhism that would be a bit of a, seen as a form of delusion. But to wake up, not only to our, you know, our, our own present moment experience, but to really feel and understand the consequences of how we live our life. The Buddha was really, uh, more than anything else, was a consequentialist. Uh, he was concerned about consequences, that the consequences we do are skillful, helpful, beneficial. And th the consideration of, of what is healthy and beneficial uh, probably shouldn't stop just as what's visible to us in the present moment, but also to give consideration to the ripple effect of our life out into the world. And so that we can feel, live a life of of contentment, of ease, of happiness, of blamelessness, we really feel better and better about how we live our life in this complicated, interrelated, interdependent life that we live, uh, that we can participate in it in a healthy way. And so how we use our, our money as well, do we use it to support what's going on in the world around us? Um, so I think of money uh, as... Um, as a kind of like a spin. You know, money is just a, you know, a symbolic for value. But I think of it as kind of, uh, when, we, when we spend money, we put a spin into the world. And so if we go buy uh, alcohol or buy cigarettes, uh, we put a certain spin into the world. 
if we go and buy organic produce, we put a different spin in the world. And, um, and uh, buy cigarettes, we supporting the production of more cigarettes. If we buy organic food, we're supporting the continuation and development of organic food. And, um, and so what we do with our livelihood, how we support ourselves, the same thing. What is it? That what spin do we put out into the world? What, um, we, if we're buying something that was cr- uh, uh, created by the destruction of rainforests or mining uh, rare metals in some place where they use child labor, then uh, there's a certain spin to our, our spending patterns. It has an effect and influence that goes out into the world. We don't always know where that spin goes, but it's kind of like a negative spin. But to do a positive spin, it's kind of like voting with your money. What kind of world do we want to live in? And, um, and we see this emphasis on right livelihood and care and attention to where the spin is and what we do. In one of the few places where the Buddha, in my reading, um, is really categorical about a statement about what to do and not to do. It isn't just the principle of, do, of avoiding harm or what's unskillful. And that is in his uh, enumeration of five forms of livelihood which are considered wrong livelihood. And, um, and this is, uh, tra- it's all have to do with trading. Uh, so the, being in the business of uh, trading in weapons, trading in living beings, so it would mean trading in, in, um, in um, you know, cattle and chickens and, you know, that business of selling animals, but also uh, the trading of people. So slavery, certainly, um, uh, pimping and sex trade, perhaps, of human beings. Um, that would also be a kind of uh, trading in human beings, which would be wrong livelihood. Uh, trading in intoxicants, trading in poison, and uh, trading in meat. So being a butcher or selling meat um, would be, the Buddha uh, uh, treated all of these as wrong livelihood, perhaps because of the spin they put out into the world, that they perpetuate a certain uh, uh, tendency to cause harm. And perhaps these kinds of trades do more harm than they do good for others and more suffering. And so what's the alternative right livelihoods that really benefit the world and support the world and decrease the suffering of our world? And this is, a, since people spend a lot of their time, some people, people who work, a lot of time at work, and sometimes it's through their work that they have the biggest impact on the world. Uh, the question of right livelihood is a very profound one, very personal and very consequential, and sometimes very difficult to look at because of... Uh, and willingness to look at it because uh, sometimes people realize that their profession uh, is wrong livelihood. It's, they're causing harm in the world. And, uh, and they're horrified by this. Some of the uh, wonderfully and very ethical people who were involved in uh, creating the whole social media and computers and, um, you know, in this whole technology world that's so big and right now, uh, you know, built and built all these kind of big websites and big tech companies and thought they were doing good in the world. And then not a few of them were kind of horrified at some point. They wait a minute. I'm not sure that this is, I've been involved in right livelihood. So I'm saying this uh, not to single anything out, but to point out that sometimes it, it's a very deep personal reflection that's not always easy to really consider this question Am I living for the welfare of the world or is what I'm doing harmful in some way? So how is it we live our lives? More generally, what is our, what is our lifestyle? What is the way we live? What are the predominant ways we're supported and that we impact the world? That that's part of the Eightfold Path. And as part of the Eightfold Path, it's not a punitive uh, investigation. It's not a moralistic investigation. It's not meant to judge us as good or bad people, but it's a way of continuing to develop 
uh, spiritually, to continue to develop the spiritual path to liberation and freedom. That how we live our lives is just as much part of the path to freedom as meditation. And so if we only meditate as being the only way, the part of the path, we're really shortchanging ourselves of the full potential that this path has for us. So you might want to give some thought to this today, next uh, until we meet again, maybe talking to friends and thinking about this, maybe journaling or going for walks, and really considering deeply what your relationship is to uh, how you live and the impact that has on yourself and the world around you. And, um, and I hope in this kind of reflection that um, you understand delightfully, happily, uh, inspiringly uh, how to live more for the benefit of all beings. Thank you very much. <laughs>